Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His, and we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Yeah. 
song, let's sing this out. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. Yeah. I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is so season you keep repeating your promises to me Welcome back, Jesus Church. Aren't you happy to be here? Uh, please have a seat. Uh, before we get started, I want to welcome everyone who's watching online. Thank you so much for joining us, even though you can't be here. We appreciate you so much, because if we all came, if we wouldn't have fit. We'd be too close. We're trying to be safe. So thank you watching at home. Thank you, anybody who's watching the overflow. If you want to watch in the overflow, you're more welcome to watch there. Um, but we're here, we're back, we are so thankful. I didn't have any coffee this morning. I was like, man, this is going to be a rough announcement. But I am hyped <laughs> from all of you being here, so thank you. And I come to think I didn't really plan announcements. So I was just so excited to get up here. No. Hey, Aaron, can you hand me that bag real quick? Um, but welcome. Um, we've got kids in here. If you haven't got one of these bags, um, we asked Kathy, our children's director, to get something for the kids because they're in service with us. And I thought she was, it was going to be like when you go into a restaurant, you'll get a coloring pad and some crayons. But if you can see what is in here, it is amazing. I'm going to keep this for myself. But there's toys, stickers, books. Uh, kids, there is a paper. Mine's 
a little crumbled up, but hopefully yours looks better. Fill this out. Um, I know you kids got a kids competition, girls versus boys. So if you fill this out, give it back to Miss Kathy at the end, you're going to get points for your team, all right? So pay attention, follow along, and do this. Um, but thank you for being in here. We've got a lot coming up. And while we've been away, we've done a lot. Um, our, our online presence has been amazing. Our groups, people connecting, us all learning how to Zoom, telling that one person Rick, how to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, buddy. Um, uh, we've been helping people. We've been getting groceries to people who are at risk, can't get to the store. And we couldn't do that without your support. So thank you very much for um, helping us be the church. We all do this together. It's not one of us. It's all of us. So thank you. Um, and then we're going to start our JC Midweek. That's going to come up this Wednesday. So if you want to join. If you don't, don't worry. Don't feel bad for staying at home. You can still join us online. We've also got our women's ministry. That's going to start Thursday night, and you can do that online or Zoom, whatever they've been doing as well. So we're, we're not forgetting you at home. Um, one thing that happened during this break, we just didn't sit back and wait it out. We figured out, okay, God, we're, this is our situation. How can we you know, prevail, and how can we step up our game? So we stepped up, and we're not going to just leave everyone else behind because we're able to come back here. So we, Make sure you're still reaching out to your friends online, people who can't come. It, you know, it might be great for us to come back, but it might not be the same for them. So make sure we're still reaching out to everyone. We're, we're showing the love of Jesus to everyone, no matter if they can come or not. Uh, but I think that's all I've got. Gina's saying yes. Please get off the stage. <laughs> but I love you guys. Um, do not greet each other, but let's stand up and worship. Good? <laughs> You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. Till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer.
We wait a second longer, Jesus. Oh, we're right here in this presence with you, Jesus. It's nothing better. It's nothing better. It's nothing better. We want heaven and nothing else. Oh. You hold my hope. You hold. Jesus, in you there's everything, Jesus, oh, it's because of you that I have life, Jesus, yeah, yeah, oh. Sing it again.
their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children in their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you there is amen. Now, if you know the word amen, what it means is let it be so. When you say let it be so, you speak prophetically into your own life. 
And so the words that are backed up by let it be so are he is for you. May a blessing be in your life that he is in you, that there is nothing that he won't do for you, that this is what God is saying, that we are speaking over our lives, but the power behind it is let it be so. And I know that it's so. I believe that it's so. I know that God is for me, that he is a blessing and has so many blessings for my life, and he has so many blessings for your life as well. If you believe that, somebody shout out amen. 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 Well, please be seated. Can I just say welcome home? I can't even begin to tell you how awesome it is to have all of you with us this morning. It's been far too long, and I have never been more grateful for church and the freedom that we have to gather in church. I will never take it for granted again, and I pray that you won't either. I was thinking, and we've been praying as a staff and as a church and just talking about how this has never been an experience where we haven't been able to come to church, and I just pray that we would never forget what it was like so we never take it for granted again. And in my honest opinion, I think this should, as much as we are so blessed to be able to have this opportunity to come together, we should be praying for those who they don't get to, because the end of a pandemic, they get to go back to church. You know, there are people in other countries who don't get an end date to, I can't go back to church. They, this is their reality. And I think we should be praying more fervently, more passionately for those people who this is their experience all the time where they can't come and join together in a group without being persecuted. That's happening every single day. And so it just put on my heart that, that we need to be praying for those people and interceding for them and the situations they're going through. And I know there's still some of you who are online that you're not here with us, and we understand, and uh, we love you, and we uh, hope that you can be with us again soon. Um, but we're just glad that you're online with us and you are a part of our family. Please, please make sure that you reach out to me personally to people in the church, connect with people in the body, because the Bible tells us that we have to stay together. We need to stay connected so that the enemy doesn't come in and try and mess with our minds and mess with our hearts. So uh, welcome to you as well. This last week, or this last month, we've been in a series, and we've been talking about John 3.16. The series is called 3.16, and really looking at what John 3.16 tells us. So I believe that this is as the most famous verse that most of us will ever know, that most of us maybe even haven't memorized, that this is the foundation, that this is the crux of the gospel. And when you look at John 3.16 and the power behind it, the power of what it says, the, the gospel contained in a single verse, What we know is because of this verse, if we believe in this verse, if we understand that this verse is true, the rest of the Bible becomes completely empowered by that. And so we've been going through different verses, uh, specifically different 316s in the Bible, and looking at how our lives are empowered to live for Jesus because of what John 3.16 says. So we went through Malachi 3.16. We went through Matthew 3.16. Last week we went through 1 John 3.16, which is probably the second most famous 3.16. And it talks about laying down your life. It talks about dying to yourself. Why would we do that? Because God gave his son as well. That Jesus died. That Jesus laid down his life. And if my job is to be like Jesus, then I need to be like what he did. I need to emulate him. He laid down his life, so I laid down my life. And in John, 1 John 3, 16, we see three crucial ways where we're told and implored to lay down our lives. And the first one was to die to hate. That there is so much hate in this world. And we as Christians, as reflections of Jesus, can't have hate in our hearts. That we have to lay that down. Even if things that were wrong happen to us, we have to lay it down. And then we need to, del- to die to a closed heart as well. A lot of times what we say is, okay, I won't hate anybody, but I don't want anything to do with them. 
And there are times where you need space from people, and I understand that, but we have to die to closing off our hearts because there are people where Jesus will put them in your path, and you're like, I can't stand that person, but Jesus put them in your path for a reason. And so you got to open up your heart. We have to die to a closed heart. And then thirdly, it talks about dying to this idea of this is my life. And I'll do what I want to do. And I'm going to strike while the iron's hot. That we lay down our life because we trust that Jesus has a greater life for us than we could ever have. So this morning, we're going to go back to the central verse, John 3, 16. We're going to switch things up a bit because I believe that God would have a, a very specific word for us in the time that we're living, in the experiences that we're all dealing with, with our neighbors are dealing with, with our family members are dealing with. Something that I believe that when we look at 3, 16, we see in the nature of this verse, in the nature of Jesus, which should reflect the mindset that we have as Christians. So John 3, 16, this is what it says. I have it memorized in case you were wondering. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now this word life, right at the very end of this verse, is sort of, it's the central part, it's the point. It's sort of the core of everything, this idea of life, that God gave us life, and the whole Bible is to bring us back to life. And the word life in the Greek, it's the word zoe. It's a beautiful word. Uh, this in the Strong's um, Greek concordance, this is what it means. It means of absolute fullness of life. It's life real and genuine, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God, blessed, in portion, even in this world of those who put their trust in Jesus. Now, if you've missed the last couple of weeks, we've talked over and over again about this idea in John 3, 16. It talks about whoever would believe. But believing means not believing somebody existed, not believing that George exists, because everyone knows George exists. It's putting your trust in Jesus, not just believing Jesus existed, but putting your trust in him, following him, giving up your life to him. So it says, it says, uh, in portion, even to, in this world, of those who put their trust in Christ. But after the resurrection to be consummated with new accessions, that means there are new things that are going to come at the end of this life. Among them, a more perfect body and to last forever. You see, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to what Jesus has done, it's actually very simple. It's God. What about God? He gave his son. Why did he give his son? So that I could have life. It goes from God to life. He loves us, so he gave his son. Why? So we could have life. The whole point is life. Right here, this is the gospel. Yeah. This is the heart of what every single one of us believes in. And please hear me, that it can never be anything else. The heart of the gospel is the love of God to bring life to every single human being on this planet. That it always has to be that way. As much as the rhythmic heartbeat in my chest is God's love for you that will consistently live on forever. And now I want to go to another verse in um, another chapter in John. It's in John chapter 14, and this is what it says. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, in the way you know. Now, enter in a guy named Thomas. He's a disciple of Jesus. He's been with Jesus for a long time now. And Thomas is like a normal guy. He's the guy with practical concerns. He hears something. He doesn't just nod his head. He actually wants to know the why. And we see that 
throughout the story of Thomas, if you look after Jesus' resurrection from the dead, you see this even more in his personality. It says, and Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And this is Jesus' answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. This morning I want to talk about the idea of keeping it simple. Would you pray as we start this uh, morning? Father, we thank you that we can meet here, we can gather, that we can experience the word and your presence together in this place, Lord. And I, I pray for um, those around the world who maybe don't get to come back to a place and worship freely, and they have to do it hidden, they have to do it um, underground, Lord. And we pray a blessing over them and protection over their lives, Lord. But this morning, as we hear your word and, and the time and the environments that we live in, Jesus, I ask that you would just come and fill us up, God, that you would fill our tanks for those whose tanks have been emptied or depleted, God. And I pray that every one of us would hear what you would want to speak to us individually and as a community, Jesus. I pray that we would gain perspective, Lord, that we'd hear what the Holy Spirit would want to say to every single one of us. We believe that it will change our lives, that it will make us more like Jesus. And we ask these things in your name. And everyone said, amen. I've been waiting for that amen for a long time. So let's say it again. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Have you ever been around a friend who's clearly going through something? They're, they're clearly upset. Uh, usually uh, you want to know why, and they want you to know why. And so you start to ask sort of questions, and, and they've sent out like a cryptic text to you, or they put something on Facebook. You know these people, maybe you've been these people, where they just like text you, oh no, and then nothing else, or uh-oh, or, or something like that, and you're like, why didn't you just follow it up with the rest of what the oh no is about? But then, then what do you do? You follow it up with the question, what's wrong, right? And, and so Usually the response, you have to dig a little deeper because like, oh, nothing. It's like, oh, come on, let's get through the formalities here. Like, just tell me what you need or what's going on in your life. And, and you dig a little deeper, and the response you end up getting a lot of time is the words, it's complicated. Anyone ever get that response? It's complicated. Let me translate what it's complicated means. It means, I don't know where or how to start. And I don't really even have the energy to tell you all the details. There's just so much that, you know what, it's complicated. And the ironic thing about it is usually when they tell you what's going on, it's actually pretty simple. And, and like you as an outside party can just speak into the situation, but no one really wants that. It's like you want to slap them when they give you this simple answer. You're like, you don't understand. But the reason we do that is because we want it to be complicated. There's something in us that wants it to be complicated. And I guess my concern for many of us, especially in the world that we're living in, in right now, is that this complication, that it would spill over into our belief in Jesus, yeah, in our walk with Christ, in our Christianity, our relationship with God. And, and I understand that the world we live in, it is complex, that Life happens, that it throws you curveballs, that there's a roller coaster sometimes in life that we all deal with. And, and we start off young and, and single, and, and things seem somewhat simple, but then we grow up a little bit more, and maybe you start a career, maybe you have kids, maybe you get married, maybe you have pets, and, and things just get a little bit more complicated. Especially if you have cats, things get a lot more complicated. You, because you're thinking, why did I do this? Um, and, and you're like raising little human beings, and, and then you have a, a career where people are depending on you for things, and, and things just start to snowball, and things get more and more complicated. The fact is that there are tons of layers, and there are tons of dynamics to the life that we live in, and it's definitely, there's a lot going on. Uh, I think we can all agree with that, but the problem is so many times we just see all of these things going on and we're thinking, oh, I'm just, I'm so busy. And I don't even like that word busy because no one wants to be the person, the friend of the busy guy, right? Like nobody wants to have the busy pastor. 
No one wants to have the busy spouse, and no one wants to be raised by the busy parents. But my concern is that Christianity and our relationship with God, it absolutely is not complicated. And sometimes that's hard to hear because we think, does it seem complicated? Yeah! It seems very, very complicated. This whole idea, there's this complexity and, and, and all of these things that are going on in Christianity and, and these rules and regulations and is God happy with me or is he sad with me or is he angry at me or is he far from me or is he close to me? What's going on here? And the problem with complication is a lot of times complexity leads to confusion. And the last time I checked, we do not serve a God of confusion but a God of clarity. Amen. You see, confusion, it leads to anxiety, and it leads to hopelessness. Yeah. But what I know about the gospel, that's the antithesis to what the gospel is. Because the gospel, it brings us hope, yeah. and it brings us confidence. Especially with everything going on right now and the questions that we ask and it bleeds over into our Christianity. Why is this happening? Is this some fulfillment of prophecy from Revelation? Is it a conspiracy that is going on? Is, is this to suppress my, my religious rights? All of that stuff. And I think if for some of us, if we were to put into words what we're thinking right now, it would just be a big, ugh. Like, Oh my gosh, and I think if we haven't all been there, we all know somebody who's been there, and maybe we all are there right now, but let me remind you that when it comes to God, that it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, about a year ago, I, we, my wife and I, we bought a new house, and we wanted to do some renovation, and one of the things I wanted to renovate was I wanted a place for a TV, because I love watching sports and, and just TV in general, and so um, we had Josh and Paul, they were both working our house to go to our church, and uh, Paul had built this big, like, entertainment center, and it was great because it was super clean, it was fireplace, mantle, TV, that's all you saw, it was super uncomplicated, it's just, oh, there's the TV, that's great, but if you were to open the back door of the entertainment center, it was a mess of a web of, of cables and receivers and plugs and all, all sorts of stuff. All of this stuff that you just, you didn't want to see. It was complicated on the, outs, on the back side, but it was clean on the front side. And a lot of times, I think when it comes to Christianity, we think it's just like that. We think, oh, well, if you look at it, yeah, it's great. And, and there's these happy people who are singing songs and come to church, and, and it's awesome. But on the back side of it, it's super complicated, and there's this web of, of things and dynamics and feelings and emotions that I have to deal with, and again, it's a God, why are you mad at me right now, or did I screw up again, and what are all these do's and the don'ts, and, and I got to wrap my head around this web of Christianity because to me, this whole thing is so complicated, and we look, and just like Thomas, we say, well, well all of these other people, they seem to know but me as Thomas, I'm looking at Jesus, and I'm thinking, I don't know. Like, I just don't know. This is a lot more complicated than just, I'm here. Like, Jesus, I, I don't know if I can just hang on to that, if I can handle this idea. And so we come to church, and we see everyone else, and it seems like they know, and they come in, and, and they know when to sing, and when to amen, and when to talk, and, and when to smile at somebody. And, and, or maybe, maybe you come in, and you're just like, I don't, I don't know. But the problem is that at some point, with something, all of us could say, I don't know, but we come in and we think, well, I, I know, but we don't know. And then other people come in and they don't know because really we all just don't know. Amen. And Jesus, what does he say to Thomas and the disciples? He says, you know. And Thomas is this guy, he's just sick of it all. He's looking around, he's like, what? Well, I know? Peter, do you know? No, I didn't think so. John, do you know? James, how about you? Do you know? Jesus, none of us know. 
Like, what are you talking about here? This, none of us know what's going on. We don't know the way. We don't even know what you're talking about. Jesus, would you please explain? Like, I need this roadmap written out for me because I don't know, and I don't even know how to know. And there's a good chance when Jesus gives the answer that they don't like it any more than we like it when Jesus gives us the answer that he gave to the disciples. Thomas doesn't know. Jesus still says, you know, which is probably insanely frustrating because you're like, I'm telling you I don't know. Don't tell me what I know and what I don't know. But Jesus stands in front of Thomas, who's convinced that he has no clue what's going on, that he needs more answers, that he needs more training, that he needs more time before he does what Jesus is calling him to do. And Jesus looks Thomas in the face and says, I'm right here. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, meaning that I am the answer, that I am your one-stop shop. I am your Walmart. You don't need to go anywhere else, whether you need an oil change or you need celery. Like, I can get all of that stuff to you. It's just that simple. That you have the answer staring you in the face. That we have the answer staring us in the face. You see, all you need is Jesus. He's all any of us will ever need. And it's so amazing because we think, well, I don't know about that. Because I need a class to tell me how to act with Jesus and how to love Jesus and how to relate with Jesus. You know, there are churches in China underground led by teenagers with three pages of the Bible that have been ripped out for them. And they are so in love with Jesus and people are flourishing there and they are passionate about what God is doing. They might not know much, but what they do know is they love Jesus. I mean, have you ever met, it's interesting, a a seasoned saint, somebody who's been through a thing or two in life, you know what's continually coming off of their lips? It's, I love Jesus. Oh, I want to be like that. I want to be 85, 90 years old just saying, I love Jesus. And it's so funny because we start off in Sunday school singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And then 85 years later, we finally get back to that place where we say and understand, this is what it's all about. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You see, it's not complicated. It's Jesus. It's not complicated. It's Jesus. But we go back to worrying about all this other stuff. Uh, we'll say, well, when's the next training on signs and wonders? Because I, I need that in my life. Or when are you going to preach on the seven bulls and the four horsemen that we find in Revelation? Because I need that in my life. And when's the next prayer and prophecy seminar that we're going to have? When are we going to learn about pre post destiny or pre post or trip or pre- free will or, or predestination? When are we going to learn all that? Because I need that in my life. And listen, I'm not opposed to any of those things, but just so you know that here at this church will never be the main point. Let me prove it to you. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 7 says, this is what will happen at the end of the age. Matthew seven twenty one. it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me on that day, and this will absolutely happen when Jesus returns, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? It says they'll cast out demons. They'll know how to do that. They'll know how to prophesy. They'll know how to do all these other things. But what does Jesus say? But did you know me? did all of these other things, but did you know me? And listen, I'm all for praying and prophesying and training, but I bet when you go to those churches in China, that there's very little classes on prophesying and praying that are happening. Uh, I guarantee you that they are telling other people about Jesus, and what I believe is amazing is that even though those aren't happening, It's probably prophesying and praying and healing and and believing in evangelism. That's all happening in any ways because when you get Jesus, what? You get everything else. You see, it's not complicated. 
I, I can't tell you how many times I had someone, and, and they're, they're just getting involved in the church, and, I, and I'm talking to them about what is God speaking to you, and how would God want to use you? And you're like, well, let, let me just hold off a little bit on that, because I need to learn how to do all of these things before I can minister. And, and I understand, there's time to, understand, to learn and, and to be trained up, but the mentality of I have to be a certain way, or I have to have a certain achievement before I can allow God to minister through me in my life, you would never see a church in China if that was the case. In fact, you wouldn't see an early Christian church in general. It doesn't matter where in Rome it was, you wouldn't have any of them. They just loved Jesus so much. They, they cared and, and experienced so much of what Jesus had for them that they just went out and they said, Jesus loves me, and I believe that Jesus loves you as well. It's not complicated. And the biggest disservice that I could do for you as your pastor is if we did prophecy classes, cast out demons, learned all these things, and yet at the end of the day, you don't know him because we focused on the wrong thing. And again, I'm not against those classes at all, but the focus always has to be first and foremost on Jesus. I could teach you how to pray three times a day, an hour each time, read three in the old, two in the new. But the important question, the all-important question is, do you know Jesus, and does he know you? See, everything else will take care of itself. We think it's so complicated, but really, is it supposed to be? I don't think so. I think we, just in ourselves, we want to make it that way, that we're prone to want complication in our lives. When you look at Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, right at the beginning of his ministry, when you look through the book of Acts, uh, he goes on one of his first missions, and he goes to this place called Mars Hill. And Mars Hill was sort of like the mecca for all of this high-end learning and philosophy and people talking about um, theories and, and ideas. And some of the greatest minds in the world were there at Mars Hill. And Paul goes there to the middle of the cerebral capital of the world, and he sort of gets sucked in. This is right pretty much at the beginning of his ministry, and so he starts to unpack and reason with these people, with these intellectuals, on why it makes sense that God is God and that Jesus came. And he goes through all this, and please hear me, I'm not against intellectualism or, or learning or any of that, but what happens is that this ends up being one of the most unsuccessful missions that Paul ever has. In fact, what we see later on in Acts is that he shakes the dust off of his body. Why? Because there's so little fruit from this, this mission that he has. And then right after he leaves, Paul writes a letter, and it's one of the first letters he writes to the church in Corinth. And so in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 2, this is what... Paul comes to a conclusion of after going and talking to all of these intellectuals. He says these words, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is a man who has the scriptures memorized. This is a man who knows it all. This guy would be Mensa material if they had Mensa back then. See, if anybody knows, it's Paul. If anyone could say, I understand, it's Paul. But what he realizes is it doesn't even matter. And not saying education is bad, knowledge is bad, or learning. But he decided, I'm going to push all of this aside. And I've come to the conclusion that all I need is to know Jesus, what he did for me, and allow him to love me. In other words, what Paul came to the conclusion of is, it's not complicated. I don't need all of the explanations. All I need to know is Jesus loves me. This I know. Another story where Jesus is uh, going up a mountain, we call it the transfiguration, and Peter, James, and John are invited on the mountain with Jesus. And then who shows up? It's Moses and it's uh, Abraham. They're, they're there. And um, it's called the Transfiguration. And on this mountain, Peter, he sees all this going on, and he sort of freaks out. That He's like, 
oh my gosh, like, look who's here. It's Moses. What am I going to do about this? And so he, he, he sees Moses, and, and he looks at Jesus, and he thinks, I'm going to make tabernacles for all of you. I, I'm going to make a tent for you to stay in. And he says, Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here right now because, because I'm here, and you're here, and this is all really great, but let me do something about it, right? That's what Peter is saying. Like, let me, let me figure this whole thing out. And, and he starts trying to make things complicated, and he's trying to do something more than just being with Jesus. Jesus never asked him to do this. All Jesus said was, come up here with me. But Peter decides, I need to do more than that. And then this booming voice from heaven God the Father, it literally shakes the mountain. And do you know what his words were? This is my beloved son, hear him. You want to know what he's saying? There's no need, Peter, for you to get busy. All you need to do is focus on Jesus. You see, it's our job not to focus on a system it's our job not to focus on success or a plan or a person or a program. We will not complicate our lives from the simplicity of what we are supposed to find in our Christ. You see, there's no tabernacle necessary. God says, just be quiet and listen to my son. If you would just focus on him, you want to build and you want to make things and you want to create something, but my son never told you to do that. All he said to do was be with him. You see, the heart of Christianity is well, just be with Jesus. Just love Jesus and allow him to love you as well. And I refuse to build tabernacles in this church to do anything but Jesus. I refuse to do anything with our efforts and our sweat and our resources and our plans. I won't do anything except for if it points to Jesus. The point is our Savior, that, that we, we can have programs, we can have all those things, but if they don't point to the Son of God, and if my heart and my motive isn't to just glorify Jesus and bring other people to Jesus and to bask in the love and, and the understanding that Jesus loves me as well, then, then I'm not building a tabernacle for it. And we're not building a church around that. My goal and our goal, the whole point of who we are, is to see humanity reach with the gospel, and that is it. Thomas says, I don't know. We say, I don't know. You act like you know, but, but you don't know. We're not ready. I need more details. I need more information. I can't do this yet. The only details you need are the simple ones. You don't need more information. You need more relationship. Jesus says to Thomas, I am the way. That's his answer. I am the way. I'm right in front of you, and I'm the way. And then Jesus, he gives two reasons for his answer. He gives the reason of truth. I am the truth, and I am the life. Truth meaning that Jesus is the sole revelation of God the Father. That he is the exclusive revelation of on this planet of who God is. If you are looking for God, look no further than Jesus. And then he also says that I am the life, meaning that he's saying that he is the source of all life. And the only way to reclaim life that was lost in the garden is through Jesus. Why? Because he reconnects you with the Father. You remember in the garden in Genesis and there's this tree in the center of the garden. It's the tree of life. And Adam and Eve, they have a choice to either eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or they can eat from the tree of life, and they choose knowledge over life. And when they choose knowledge over life, they are severed from the life. The tree of life was a representation 
of God the Father because what we know is the Father is life. And so when Jesus comes, the connection with the Father was restored if we have a relationship with Jesus because he bridges that gap. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's saying that I am reconnecting you to the Father because in him is the basis of everything that we should care about, which is life. And the entire point, the only reason, is a simple answer. And it's found in Jesus. That he is the way. Why? Because he is the truth. He is all you ever need to find the Father. And he is the life. That he connects us back to the life, the blood that we lost. It's that easy. It's that simple. And when we go out, and our comings, and our going, and we're thinking, oh my goodness, all this stuff is going on. All we have, just as the song said, he's with you. He's with you. He is with you. He is with you. I no wonder the Bible says we have to come like a child. Why? Because a child, when you tell them something, they're like, okay, great. I'll go with that. Well, until they become teenagers, but. What I know is, I don't want to look back as a church and say, hey, we had some awesome programs. We had some great tabernacles we built. Great prophecies, great signs and wonders. I can't believe everything that we did. But in looking back at who we are, what I want us to be known for is Jesus that we love Jesus and we were loved by him and we told the world around us of the love that we've experienced and the love that they can have as well, that all of those other things will follow. Remember what Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first Jesus is what he's saying there and all of these things will be added to you. So interesting because the context of Jesus saying that is right after him talking about not being anxious five times in eight verses. Uh, by the way, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Did I tell you not to be anxious? Oh yeah, don't be anxious. And one more time, don't be anxious. And the way you do that is by seeking first Jesus, his righteousness, the righteousness of God, which is found in Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I want to close with just looking at Peter because when you look at Peter's life, um, he seems to have it all figured out at many points. Right before Jesus is crucified and arrested, he's, he sounds like he's got his entire life planned out. I know because I know. And Jesus says, um, this is going to happen. He says, no, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen because I know, right? And this Peter like, has every confidence in the world that he knows. And, and so Jesus says, you, you, don't, you don't know because you're going to deny me three times. Like, oh, no, I know. I know what's going on. I know how this is going to go down. There's no way I'm letting anyone touch you, Jesus. But by the end of the night, what happens? He's denied Jesus three times, and he's gone from thinking he knows to having no clue at all, and, and he's become more complicated. And is he anxious more than ever before? And, and you see the crucifixion happens, and he is found after the crucifixion. And what is he doing? He, he's given up on the call God had on his life, and he's back at fishing. Why? Because things are so complicated. When you allow things to be complicated, you will give up on God's plan for your life. He's fishing. He doesn't want anything to do with anything else. Why? Because he can't see anything except for the complexity of life that he is in a storm of. And, and so he's fishing, and, and Jesus is resurrected, and he's sort of given up because things are way too complicated. And what happens? Jesus, he calls him in with all the other disciples, and, and he cooks some breakfast, which is sort of interesting. And, and Jesus is sitting there, and it's really awkward because none of them are talking about it. They know who he is, but they can't believe it. And they're like, ah, what are we going to say? This is a weird conversation we're going to have. And, and Jesus, what does he do? He looks at Peter, and he says, do you love me? Let me unwrap your complication with one word. Do you love me? 
what Jesus wants to do for every single one of us. He wants to unwrap you. He wants to take away the tangled web of wires that you think are your relationship with God. He wants to pull it all away, and he wants to look you in the eye, and he wants to say, do you love me? And the very last thing that Jesus tells Peter is follow me. It's so simple. Don't allow your relationship, especially in the world we live in today, to become complex, to be full of anxiety and confusion because the Jesus that you and I serve wants you to have a simple faith, a simple understanding of a relationship as I love you because you love me. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we thank you so much for sending your son. Lord, I thank you that this is not a complicated thing, that a relationship with you is love, your love for us and our love back to you. Lord, I pray this morning if we're dealing with being wrapped up in, in a bunch of anxiety or confusion or questions or, or, or stipulations or expectations in our life, Lord, I, I pray that you would start to unwind us, unravel us. Lord, get us back to the place, as David said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. God, I pray that we wouldn't move from that place. God, that we wouldn't wander from that place. God, that the deepest place that we will ever be in relationship with you is right there in the simple truth of the gospel, that you love us so much that you gave your son. Why? So that we could have life forever. Jesus, help us never to move from that place. As a congregation, individually, as families, Lord, as friends, God, that we would always be right there in the sweet spot of your love for us, Jesus. Renew us. Restore unto us. Help us to get back to that simple place, that simple truth. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, it's, Jesus, I love you. I want to give my life to you. I want to trust in you because I now believe in you. So Jesus, just love me because I know you want to, that you already do, and I am returning that love to you. If that's you this morning with every head down and every eye closed and you want to receive that love for Jesus, to, to accept that love from him, and I just on the count of three, I want you to shoot up your hand so I can pray with you for Jesus' love to just fill you up on the count of three. One, two, three. Is there anyone here this morning? Well, Jesus, we thank you so much for this group of believers, Lord, the, the call that you have on this church to just resound a mighty cry of your love for us. Lord, I pray that we would never stray from that goal and that mission. And it's all about your love for us and us just returning what you've already given to us. Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love and your grace. We ask these in your name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank God? Well, we're going to just, um, are we going to sing a song? No? We haven't done this. We forgot how to do the end of church, I guess. I just want you to know Jesus loves you. We're going to go out and we're going to spread the gospel to the world we live in. So thank you so much for being here this morning. Uh, we'll be back next week, and we'll have kids in service. And then after that, we'll have kids' church in two weeks. So, yeah, praise God. We love it when our kids get to learn on their level as well. But God bless. Please uh, stand up and um, say hi, holy high five to somebody. We love you, and we'll see you next week. Hi, Jesus Church. Thank you for watching. We hope God spoke to you through his word today. If you're looking for more sermons, ways to connect, or would like to support our ministry through your tithes and offerings, you can find us at our website, jesuschurch.life. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook, where we have daily devotionals and other ministry opportunities. See you next time. God bless.